Good morning, good day, good afternoon to everybody joining us today for the Future of Food Leadership Development for the Movement. I'm Susan Lightfoot Shemp with the Wallace Center, and I am delighted to be joined today with Farsana Sarang from the Castanea Fellowship and Navina Khanna from Heal um, Food Alliance, where we'll be talking about some great opportunities for building power and leadership in the good food movement um, here in the United States. So thanks everybody for being with us today. Um, real quickly, I'm just going to do a quick overview of our agenda for the day. So I'll start out with giving a quick technology check, um, make sure that we can make the most out of this technology, and then I'll be handing it over to Farsana, um, who's going to talk with us about you know, why we're coming here today, together today um, and how we're collaborating around leadership development um, with our programming. Um, then the three of us are each going to individually present on our programs, the Food Systems Leadership Network, the Castanea Fellowship, and the Heal Food Alliance's School of Political Leadership. Um, then we'll do a recap of all the great opportunities that are coming available in this next year, and then have plenty of time at the end for question and answer um, and some discussion. So it's going to be a great conversation today. Um, thanks again to everybody for joining us. Um, we have over 500 registrants from all 50 states and the District of Columbia representing um, a bunch of different sectors and kind of points of view within the food system from nonprofit staff, farmers, funders, educators, researchers, um, even some food hubs out there, processors, just, you know, folks that are working at all different points along the food system. Just really appreciate you taking out of your time and your busy days um, to be here with us. Um, so these are the three of us that are joining today, myself, Farsana, and Navina. With that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Farsana to talk with us about what's bringing us here um, today. Farsana? Thank you, Thank you Susan. Um, so what's bringing us together today is really the fact that movement work to make a good food system is multi-sector. It's multi-sector and it takes all of us as farmers, laborers, workers, policymakers, activists, scientists, entrepreneurs, environmentalists, community de developers, funders, so many of you who are on the call. And as Audrey Lord says, one of my favorite people is that there is no single thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And as you see before you, Ella Baker's quote really resonates with me because we all have the joy of being able to support important leadership. We're really here for you, potential folks who wanna be leaders. And we are in the lovely privileged business of being able to kind of support leadership development. And I also wanna be reminded and hold Grace Lee Boggs and her words about us learning and being the people we hope to be in order to not only talk about change, but be the change. So really wanna welcome you all to this call to learn about our work and hopefully we can make it a bit easier for you to think about where and how you'd like to join us in our collective work to support leaders of all types. Now we're also definitely distinct joint organizations. So I wanted to invite both Navina and Susan to share what brings them to this call and what they'd like to make sure we leave away knowing. So Navina, I'd love to really start with you and your reflections on leadership and it's what it means to us as part of movement work. Yeah, I think that you covered it. We know that for all of us, um, being part of a movement means that we uh, we need multiple leaders where we need a leader full movement that um, represents all of us. And um, when you'll hear more about this as you hear about each of our programs, but you'll hear us each talking about ways that we are sharing leadership and ways that um, folks are lending their expertise to one another, building on legacies um, of both our ancestors that uh, Farzana already mentioned, and the the elders and political ancestors that are that continue to be with us. Um, so we're excited to keep growing our leadership, keep growing our shared leadership, and um, yeah, create movement that makes transformative change. Yeah, I would maybe just add that um, you know this work is really hard, and no matter where we are in our careers and our journeys as leaders, that we are always learning and growing. And it's amazing to have um, a wide diversity of opportunities to develop out different parts of ourselves and our skill sets. And I think that what you'll see today is that we have a really wide breadth of support offered through these three different programs and additional programs that are out there, um, you know, operating nationally. And I think that, you know, what I what I have a feeling around is like an embracing of, of everyone, wherever you are in your own personal journey as a leader, as a practitioner, as an activist, as an organizer, um, and that we're always growing and there's always 
something um, that we can learn from others. And I think that there's also that real spirit within all three programs, um, you know, building on what Navina said, that there's great expertise and wisdom and knowledge within this movement. And there's such power in connecting people um, to share that wisdom and knowledge with one another. And I really think that the more that we can do that of connecting across um, sectors, across issue areas, and really and across communities, that we are stronger um, and much more powerful um, and can really get a lot further together. Thank you, Susan. And I believe we're going to start with you. All right. Thanks. So um, it's really a great honor to be able to, to present um, the work that we've been doing through the Food Systems Leadership Network alongside these two other um, organizations. Um, so, you know, before I talk about the FSLN, I just want to give a quick overview about the Wallace Center um, because the Food Systems Leadership Network is a program of the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Um, so let's see here. Come on, slides. There we go. Um, so the Wallace Center is a national organization. Uh, we were founded in 1983, so have been around for a pretty good um, long haul here and have really been working for all this time to um, develop partnerships, pilot ideas, and advance solutions to strengthen communities through resilient farming and food systems. Um, the Wallace Center has come to be a real partner um, in talking about, um, you know, how the, the nuts and bolts of advancing local and regional food systems in the US. Um, we're working towards building more environmentally and economically viable, sound um, farm and food businesses. Um, we also work quite a bit in supporting economic and community development initiatives in communities on um, both rural and urban. And you know, ultimately working towards stronger and more resilient community-based food and farming organizations. Um, many times that has been you know, social enterprises, like for example, through some work we did in partnership with the USDA some years back through the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Program. Um, also in partnership with the Kellogg Foundation and providing technical assistance to community-based organizations that are working on equitable food systems and communities across America um, and doing a lot of kind of thought partnership and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange specifically around the um, innovation of food hubs. Um, and so, you know, the Wallace Center has come to be a real partner to folks working on the ground, as I was saying. Um, these are some of the ways in which we work. Um, come on, slide. There we go. Oops, excuse me. Okay. Um, one of the key strategies of the Wallace Center is to develop communities of practice, recognizing that, you know, as I was mentioning before, that there is such um, a depth of knowledge within the people who are doing this work, um, and there is um, a lot of power in connecting people to share that knowledge with one another. Um, and so it's one of the ways that we developed learning networks, communities of practice to build capacity and provide technical assistance, not just a top down model of an expert explaining how things should be done, but much rather, you know, hearing from peers to exchange what's working, what's not, to learn from our failures, um, to push each other to learn more, and to then share out our knowledge, um, you know, with funders, with the USDA, and with other communities so that we can really help to advance our work. Um, and as part of this work of the Wallace Center over the last, you know, maybe 15 years or so in supporting community-based organizations that are doing food systems development work, we realized that there are um, you know, there's always the, the kind of program strategies that we're wanting to share out of like an innovation around the food hubs, for example, um, food safety, you know, things that are around kind of technical knowledge. But kind of underneath all of that, um, there's people and there's organizations that are the folks that are doing this work and the organizations are the, the engines for, um, for leading the, the transformative food systems change that we're working on. And we recognize that at the organizational level, um, there's you know, still a need for support, for technical assistance around organizational effectiveness and, and ongoing leadership. And so you know, that's really where the, the Food Systems Leadership Network 
um, came into being. We recognized that we needed to, to develop a community of practice where staff and leaders of nonprofits um, could connect with one another, share information about how they're using their organizations as a tool for change, um, and also work towards building up new leadership um, within our organization so that we can carry on this work for the long haul. Um, so the Food Systems Leadership Network is really focused on systems leadership development. So that's around fostering collective leadership. Um, this isn't about the, you know, the leader in the front of the room that's taking charge and telling folks what to do, but much rather, you know, a leader who comes up alongside um, communities and um, really fostering change through dialogue, um, through systems thinking skills, through being able to bring um, our communities forward towards transformative change. So, you know, also looking at organizational effectiveness and, and again, you know, kind of this ongoing theme around increasing access to community knowledge, information, and resources. Um, the Food System Leadership Network has a really wide range of opportunities available. Um, and I'll be going over those in just a second. And this uh, network is open to all. There's no cost for membership, although um, the some of the services are limited for staff and leaders of 501c3 nonprofits. Um, some of our, um, just since actually since January, we launched the Food Systems Leadership Network. Um, we've already brought on about 1,650 members in all 50 states, uh, representing urban, urban, rural, and tribal communities. Um, the vast majority of these members are working in 501c3 nonprofits and are doing a really wide range of food systems work from, you know, youth development farms to, you know, food hubs and all kinds of social enterprises. Um, so really interesting and diverse group of members within this network. Um, and we've also had about, the, to date, I think it's about 300 organizations that those members are a part of. And just something I wanted to show here is that we've got um, a really diverse group of organizations in terms of the size of the organization and the maturity of them, which I think um, really facilitates a, um, a great way of sharing knowledge, experience, and information with one another. Um, so it isn't that this network is only for emerging leaders or, or startup organizations, for example. I mean, we have some organizations that are part of the Food Systems Leadership Network that have been around for, you know, 25 plus years um, and also some startups. And we have teeny tiny organizations that are all volunteer led to, you know, organizations that are over a million dollars in their annual budget. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting to see the kinds of knowledge exchange that can happen amongst um, organizations that have such a wide breadth of experience um, in this movement. So a couple of things I'll quickly touch on and what the, the um, Food System Leadership Network offers to its members. Um, first, we have the Community Food Systems Mentorship Program, which facilitates relationships between folks in this movement that have um, you know, significant experience and expertise. Um, folks like Malik Yakini, who's pictured here alongside his mentee, Ruth Tyson, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, you know, it's really an opportunity to connect um, practitioners and, and activists and organizers um, to learn from one another. And, and again, you know, not, you know, someone telling another how to do things or how to do their work, but to really come up alongside one another and provide um, support across generations, across communities, across sectors. Um, so the Community Food Systems Mentorship Program will be going into our third cohort in early 2019, which I'll talk about some of the, um, the dates for that program shortly. Um, and it's been a really fantastic and deep and meaningful um, opportunity for leaders. Um, secondly, we have the Nonprofit Boot Camp e-learning series, which is really focused on uh, strengthening really the, like the nuts and bolts of nonprofit management um, operations and leadership. So that is an e-learning series that has um, short lessons that are recorded and then archived in our virtual community of practice, um, which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, those Short lessons are immediately followed up by group office hours, so it provides a, a platform for that knowledge exchange and discussion around topics that are really important and kind of sticky issues for us as we're leading and running nonprofits. 
um, and programs in our communities. And then participants in those learning series can then um, sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching with the trainers. And we do our best to select trainers who have um, lived experience in um, doing this work in community from, um, you know, really lifting up uh, practitioners as experts. And so, you know, you'll see in the different courses that we offer that the folks that are training, that are, that are presenting as trainers are, um, you know, our peers who have experience actually doing this work in community. Uh, we also, through the Food Systems Leadership Network, offer a series of systems leadership retreats. And this is where we're digging into um, that collective leadership strategies and, um, and capacities as individuals um, and as a, as a movement. Um, we've done three of these retreats so far in Detroit, New Orleans, and Kansas City. And we'll be offering another one um, in June, or sorry, in May of this coming year in partnership with Food Solutions New England, which we're really excited about. So that um, leadership retreat is going to be focused on um, network builders. So we'll be coming out with more information about um, the network leadership retreat in the next month or so. Um, through the FSLN, we also offer resources for organizations to build up capacity within the organization and within um, staff members. So we've been able to support um, a, probably about 30 um, professionals to attend conferences and trainings over this last year. Um, also provided small amounts of money to organizations to do really critical capacity building um, work within their own organization through um, doing racial equity trainings with their staff or bringing together partners to examine new opportunities and new strategies. Um, we've got, we're supporting an organization right now out in Hawaii that's working towards um, the uh, building a network across food systems organizations in Hawaii. So been able to provide small amounts of money to help catalyze collaboration and support the work that, that folks are doing on the ground. A um, couple more things here. We offer a lot of creative content, um, you know, through webinars, podcasts, video series. You might have seen our Visionary Voices or heard our Visionary Voices podcast this last year um, where we heard from Anupama Joshi from the Farm to School, National Farm to School Network, Malik Yakini with Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, and Paula Daniels from the Center for Good Food Purchasing um, telling us about their own individual leadership journeys. Um, so really encourage you to go and check those out, um, which can all be downloaded on iTunes um, in the um, podcast section. And finally, you know, we offer just a bunch of different creative ways to bring the network together virtually. So um, this year we'll be kicking off a series of coffee chats that'll be happening um, once a month, the third Wednesday of every month. Um, with a different topic and bringing in just having a conversation over coffee with one another to share ideas, um, to troubleshoot sticky issues. Um, we've also done a couple of digital meetups where we get to do speed dating and connect with peers across the country. Um, and pretty soon here we'll be kicking off an executive director support group um, that will be kind of coordinated through our online community practice platform. Um, I know I'm getting short on time here, so I'm just going to quickly run through, um, show you these beautiful souls that are our partners in the um, Community Food Systems Mentorship Program. These are truly um, some of the most dynamic and wise um, leaders in our movement, and you could work one-on-one -on -one with these folks um, in the, over the next couple of months. So I really want to encourage you, if you're looking for mentorship in your own leadership journey, no matter where you are, if you're an emerging leader or if you've been at this work for 20 plus years, um, there's cause, you know, always a, um, an opportunity and a role for mentorship in your life. Um, and so, you know, it's a great opportunity to connect with a peer and be able to um, really kind of identify where, where you might need support um, and connect deeper with um, others that are working in this movement. Um, as I mentioned before, we have an online a virtual community of practice platform. This is a new technology that we're testing out with the Food Systems Leadership Network. It's a really exciting space. Um, we've just kind of barely scratched the surface of what can be done here, um, but really, really 
kind of seen this as the, uh, the, the Facebook for the, the food systems um, community. So I want to encourage all the listeners today to please get on there and check it out. We've got some really dynamic discussion groups that are getting kicked off. Um, it's a great way to be able to share resources and opportunities with one another. Um, there's a very robust events calendar, e-learning library, um, and um, an archive of tools and resources also. So I want to encourage you to check out the online community practice and um, have a lot of upcoming opportunities in 2019 starting tomorrow, which is our Fail Fest. Um, so this is just you know, one of the many different kinds of webinars that we offer um, to you know, share community knowledge with one another. In the Fail Fest tomorrow, we'll be lifting up you know, things that didn't work and what we learned from them, and we'll be doing a live voting um, for the most epic fail and having a conversation around the role of failure um, in helping us grow and innovate and identify new um, ways of doing our work. Um, as I said before, our mentorship program will be kicking off again in the spring. So the applications are opening up next week. We'll be hosting an informational webinar um, in a couple of weeks for folks that are interested in, in potentially participating in that program. Applications will be closing in mid-January and mentorship will begin in February. And as I mentioned before, we have that leadership retreat coming up um, next year in May in New Hampshire in partnerships with Food Solutions New England. There'll be a lot more information coming out um, in the next couple months about that. Our nonprofit boot camp series will um, kick off again in February. Um, we'll be kicking off those coffee chats on the third Wednesday of January. And i um, not ready to announce it just yet, but we just got um, some additional resources to do some more grant making this year. So really looking forward to kicking off an innovations grant program, that executive director support group that I spoke about, and also an FSLN book club, which is my favorite new idea of a way for us to um, come together as peers, friends, and colleagues in this Food Systems Leadership Network. So lots going on. Thanks for listening to me speak. And with that, I am going to hand it over um, to Farsana to talk with us about Castanea. Thank you, Susan. It was lovely to hear about the breadth and the openness of what the programs you are offering through the Food Systems Leadership Network. The Castanea Fellowship, um, thank you. Let me, there we go. The Castanea Fellowship envisions a world where our food is the source of health, equity, and well-being for all. We invest in engaged leaders who will really make that happen. We're a new two-year fellowship for diverse leaders working for a racially just food system in the areas of health, environment, agriculture, regional economies, or community development. Castanea Fellows will build power to shift structures and culture towards the creation of a more equitable, sustainable, and healthy food system for children, families, and all communities. We give Castanea Fellows the time, space, and resources they need to connect and innovate on long-term solutions that can foster vibrant communities. What do we mean by this? Community, who we are, the various people and roles they hold within our work is important because it's in partnership with people that we are able to offer the Castanea Fellowship. And we wanna provide leaders with the resources, the time and the space to grow their personal leadership, their collective leadership, which we really believe once you work on yourself as an individual, you can work on those around you and you can transform your organizations and the way you do your work to help foster connections across silos and really help grow the movement and the work as a whole. And I wanted to sort of begin, oops, let me just go back. I wanted to begin with the community and the team and who this is. And so this is who Castanea is. We are inspired by the W.K. Kellogg Food and Community Fellowship, which existed for about a decade. And we were formed by many alumni from that group, as well as are guided by the stellar steering committee, some of whom are on this call, and even include Navina, who is one of our speakers. The core team is really includes the Winward Fund, who is our fiscal sponsor, the steering committee, who you can see here on the screen, as well as myself, the executive director, and an operations manager who will be hired in 2019. Our community also includes a large set of community advisors. I wasn't able to put everyone's photos on the website and just wanted to say that this does include our funders, such as 11th Hour, CS Fund, Wash Mop Legacy, Wash. <laughs> Sorry about that. Grace Communications Fund, John and Timmy Sobrato Charitable Fund, McKnight Foundation, now Newman Foundation, and, and Pantarea Foundation. It also includes others who wish to give in some capacity to our work. It was really an open call 
Um, so we've got people who have business expertise, farming expertise, and not all advisors are listed again. And we'll be updating this on our website. And if some of you on this call want to play a more active role in shaping who we are and the programs that we offer, I'll be happy to share that with you and welcome you to join as a community advisor. We also will be having a selection keep committee. This is kind of our democratic selection process. And the selection committee will help us select the first cohort. We are inviting a diverse set of leaders for this role and look forward to announcing the full list in January 2019. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to begin by who we're looking for. Um, Oh my, these slides are so fast. Okay, here we go. So first of all, really about finding folks who align with Castanea values. Our values are racial equity. To really mindfully transform the food system, we must first acknowledge historical practices of displacement, enslavement, and the devaluing of labor, especially among indigenous people, black families, and rural com communities. Castanea fellows will be leaders from and committed to these communities. Our fellows work will be rooted in, oh, Sorry, you all, give me one second. All right. Our fellows' works will be rooted in racial equity, and we really hope that they will leverage our resources, networks, and their own experience to develop innovative solutions. Our second value, diversity, is really about diverse approaches, perspectives, and lived experiences, which we really feel are instrumental to the fellowship success. We want to convene diverse leaders, especially those typically underrepresented in leadership roles. We have a firm commitment to have at least 50% people of color and at least 50% women on, in our cohort. We also want to make sure that our trainers reflect our country's regional diversity as well as lived experiences with regards to ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation. And we really are striving to have a multiracial cohort with a majority of people of color. When we say impact, what that means for us is that we want folks who are committed to transforming the food system on both local, regional, and national levels. We hope that they will shift policies, practices, cultures, institutions, and our narrative surrounding food. We hope that through that, these leaders can demonstrate a different and more equitable food system as possible and will inspire and generate new solutions throughout the food system. We are also looking for people who have a variety of um, experiences. And so we are welcome people who have specialized knowledge as well as people who are just beginning to sort of dive in. Our minimum is five to seven. So we're not necessarily looking for immersion. This shouldn't be your first foray into food, but it can be like, you can be early, it can be five to seven years. And we are looking for folks who are engaged and really established. You can also, there's no age limit. You can be having 20 years in the work and still want to grow and learn. And we invite you, we want you to be engaged, but we also want you to make sure that we, you've got some experience in the work. I want to also say a little bit about who this program is currently not designed for. It doesn't mean this work isn't important. Just the way that we're constructed doesn't allow us to serve these folks. This is not for academic researchers to support research. Currently, we do not, we cannot serve non-US residents. And it is not, again, for emerging leaders. And I just wanted to highlight what we meant by that, which I mentioned previously. We also have to ensure that there's a 501c3 sponsor since the award will be a grant. We do need to know you'll have a nonprofit partner organization willing to serve in this capacity. It doesn't mean you have to be in a nonprofit, but you do have to have a partner. Resources. This is really what we will hope to provide with the Castanea cohort. So it's an unparalleled opportunity to amplify your vision. It's three, six, three to six day in-person gatherings, as well as one international learning experience, $20,000 awarded each year, so $40,000 total, and support, mentorship, and love from the Castanea community. More specifically, I wanted to get into what that looks like over the course of the two years. So an opening retreat would occur in June. Our focus then would really be around leadership development, communication skills around storytelling. We're partnering with the Sustainable Agriculture Food Systems Funders Network so that you can also be introduced to our community and begin to develop vital connections then. We'll be going to the Southern region in November of 2019, really honing in on the role of racial equity and what it means for our food systems, developing skills around finance policy and organizing. We're looking at this to happen in Atlanta and Albany, Georgia. Next, we hope to go to a coastal region to, to hone in on finance, communication, organizing skills, as well as highlight the work of the food system around the coast. 
And then in August of 2020, we are looking forward to being in a tribal community where we can talk a little bit more about communications policy and um, explore sort of some of the Midwest or rural context. Our international trip would happen in January and the location would be selected by the fellows in the cohort. And then we would have a closing retreat in June that would have a focus on leadership development and part of that would include a final video presentation for leaders to share their vision. Throughout all of this, there will be ongoing activities which are opening and quarterly closing check-ins as well as coaching and mentorship that occurs through peers as well as learning evaluations. Leadership development, I just wanted to kind of go through quickly and I'll wrap this up soon. What we mean by that is just we want to support value-based leaders to develop skills to hone their leadership style. With communications, we really want to focus on how to amplify your voice and vision through clear storytelling as well as how you can showcase your work through media, print, and public policy. Looking at what local, regional, state, and national policy coordination tactics look like depending on geography and how have people really been able to shift the political landscape. And then organizing, we want to provide the opportunity to really deepen skills around digital and place-based organizing and how it can connect or further work within the food system to shift power. And finances is really important to us as a skill as well, which is how to scale a project by using public and private dollars, as well as community ownership models for business program development. So it's less around organizational finances, but really if you have a project and you want to scale it, how can we think about that? And what are the terms we need to be more comfortable with and use? The application process, as you know, we're in our first stage. The round one applications are open. They will be due January 16th. We will be letting everyone know about their status by February 1st. The second stage, round two, is when we will invite those who have advanced to a video interview. We will also be asking you for additional materials, which you will have a month to complete and get back to us. We will have all of the materials due in March, which is when we will begin to review and invite folks and further along into the third process, which will be our final round of reviews, which might be an additional phone call to your references. And then we will formally ask people to join the Castanea Fellowship April 15th. And in May, we will announce who the fellows are, as well as welcome everyone to join through a welcome webinar. I've also just recapped the learning immersion, so I'm not gonna go over that again. And I now would love to be able to pass it on to Navina to share a little bit more about her amazing work with the Heal Food Alliance School of Political Leadership. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Marzana. That was great. And um, yeah, folks, I see that some people are already putting questions into the question box. If you have questions for any of us, feel free to name them there. I know that we're all going quickly through an overview of what our programs are, but we want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions, too, is why we're doing that. Um, so I'm happy to be here with Susan and Frizana to talk about HEAL School of Political Leadership. It's a, it's a year-long program that we launched um, at the end of 2017 and just wrapped up our um, final session of this past weekend. So um, I'll tell you just a little bit about HEAL and what that program looks like. So HEAL um, grew out of a group of leaders from different sectors in the food movement, different organizations, different geographies, um, and representing different bases who really saw the need for us to have a vehicle that built our collective power to make transformative change. So we are anchored by our co-founders, which is the Food Chain Workers Alliance, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Real Food Challenge. Um, a group of organizations that came together to really think about what could it look like for us to build our collective power. And uh, we came together with this vision for transformation uh, and grounded together in this platform for real food. So um, over the course of a, of a couple of years, we talked to organizations and leaders with experience and expertise in all different areas of food and farm systems um, and came up together with this 10 point platform. You can see this in much more detail on our website, but essentially the, the point of having this 10 point platform is saying together that no, no one of us, no one organization, no one sector can do everything or will do everything, but we recognize that all of these things need to, need to change if we're gonna change our food systems. Um, and that we, we have each other's backs. We're in, we're in solidarity, we're in community together, we're building our power together to make this transformative change. 
And uh, this full platform with its planks and the policies that support each one of these um, is really grounded in an understanding that corporate concentration and the stranglehold that corporations have on our food system, unchecked capitalism, is one of the root causes of uh, why our food system is the way it is, uh, and that the historical and current legacy of racism is another root cause, and both need to be addressed um, if we're going to make transformative change. So we really root all of our work in that um, and our, our vision to build our collective power to, to change those systems. So at this point, we have 53 member organizations. Y'all are right, these slides do change really fast. Um, 53 member organizations representing different sectors, different communities. Um, HEAL, as most of you probably know, stands for Health, Environment, Agriculture, Labor, and we're bringing folks together across those different sectors to do the work. And we do our work in a few different ways. So one of them, as I mentioned, is working to expose and address corporate control of our food system. Another is working to build power in local communities that we can um, make changes uh, wherever we are and do some translocal organizing, learn from what each other are doing. And finally, uh, to cultivate political leadership. So um, we, we've known for a long time that the change that we need is not politically possible right now, and it hasn't been for a very long time. Uh, we know that the, the policies that created our food system are connected to uh, systems that have committed genocide, forced people off of the land, um, that these systems are perpetuated by, by folks who hold power and are not accountable to our communities, that don't, hold, don't center people uh, or the planet in the ways that they're making decisions. And we've seen over time that um, our elected officials, the folks who are setting policy, really, uh, we, have a, we have very few folks in there who are actually accountable. Um, what we saw, especially coming out of the, the 2016 election, is that folks are really ready to take action in their own communities. And so while we had been thinking for a long time about the kinds of political power we wanted to build, we really saw this opportunity and this moment that folks are stepping up in all parts of the country to um, make change in their own communities. And that now is the time, if ever, to work to build that, um, that political power and that leadership and real understanding of how folks can organize and drive change. So we launched the School of Political Leadership and we launched with um, a cohort uh, that began in January. And um, I'll just briefly go through some of the hard skills that folks have been learning uh, through the course of the year. So it includes power mapping, base building, communications, fundraising, and campaign strategy. And for um, in each of these areas, uh, folks who are part of the cohort are really bringing in the, uh, the leadership knowledge work that they uh, are doing in their own community to be able to map out how systems work, how power is held in their own community, and what it means for them uh, to take action in their own community. So everyone who's a part of SOPO is already a leader in um, food and farm justice organizing in their own community, and this is an opportunity for them to build their skills in political leadership. Um, so we think of that as folks who are themselves getting ready to run for office or working on somebody's campaign or trying to make significant policy change in their own communities and want to step up their skills and their ability to do that. Um, so they learn this, this set of hard skills. And then with that, of course, there's also uh, soft skills uh, that go with this. So we do a lot of work together on our shared political analysis. Um, we, we know that the, the change that each of us is trying to make is really about us being able to ground into our own leadership and our own purpose. So we ground all of the work that we're doing in, um, in somatics and our, and our body-based understanding of, of how change happens and what our own purpose is. Um, and we focus in that somatic work on, on healing for ourselves, for our communities, uh, and for the movement. Um, each session includes translocal insights. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, what that looks like in each session. And of course, really strong relationship building between the members of the cohort. And I think that's something that you'll see with each of the um, leadership programs that's being talked about. One of, the, one of the biggest benefits is the kind of relationships that you build with the people that you're in community with. Um, so this past year, we had a um, really a beautifully diverse set of individuals who are part of the, of the SOPL cohort. And um, 
I think one, one thing that folks should be aware of is that we, we emphasize and we prioritize uh, folks that are affiliated with HEAL member organizations. So um, most organizations can become members of HEAL if you uh, align with our, with our vision and values and platform um, and, uh, and you're committed to doing the joint work together. Um, but in our application process, we will prioritize folks that have a reference from or are already based at uh, a member-based organization. So these folks who were part of this first year of SOPOL are all affiliated with member organizations and uh, represented uh, coastal, border-based, urban, rural communities uh, around the country, and um, who are all at different stages of their leadership but are doing deep organizing work in, the, in their own communities um, and in different sectors. And so uh, one of the... Um, one of the powerful things about this was the opportunity for the cross learning. And uh, in this year, we managed to go to four of the communities that folks from Sokol uh, were from. So we uh, went to the Central Valley of California, to North Carolina, to Cleveland, to Minneapolis, and we just wrapped up in El Paso, Texas. Um, we really hold intersectionality at the heart of how we uh, understand making this kind of change. And so, with each of these sessions, we've been able to bring in leaders from uh, leaders and organizers from the region who have been doing this work for a long time to talk to our folks about how they do the work and to get some field-based experience um, in the community, sometimes on farm, um, sometimes door knocking, and uh, and getting to visit you know those historical sites that have made change. Um, so we always bring in guest speakers. Uh, from the community uh, and do a lot of co-learning together in each of those places. Next year, it will probably look a little bit different. We're, we're thinking more about, um, we're, still, we're still capturing all the lessons that we've learned from this year. Um, we're thinking more about how we focus even more deeply uh, in a handful of communities uh, and build with a few folks from each of the different regions that we're in. Um, You'll, you'll see us, uh, I'll turn it back to Prasanna in a minute, and she'll go through the dates and things like that. Um, we will definitely be visiting the communities that uh, SOPL participants are from for next year. Uh, and one of the lessons that we also learned from this year is making sure that we wrap up the program uh, enough in advance of the next election cycle so that folks can actually really put their skills to work um, in the 2020 election cycle. So our program will run um, from May of 2019 through the spring of 2020 so that folks have six months then to really put their work into action um, in that next election cycle. Um, so I will wrap up there and I'll turn it back to you, Frazana. Will I turn it back to you? Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you, Navina. We went through this really quickly, all of us, so that we could prioritize your questions and answers. But with that in mind, I did want to quickly do a recap of all of our major programmatic points so you can start to get a sense of who we are and some of our differences. Um, slide. Thank you. <laughs> so what are the major points? We are three distinct national fellowships working to coordinate our efforts for you. Really appreciate all of the questions and we'll get to those really shortly. Um, I just wanted to say like our unique offerings, the Food Systems Leadership Network is really focusing on like organizations. They have a mentorship program. They have lots of offerings. They're looking for leaders across the spectrum. Castanea Fellowship is really an opportunity that's looking for engaged leaders. It's a two-year program with place-based learning. We offer peer coaching and we also offer a grant award. The HEAL School of Political Leadership has incredible place-based in-depth trainings from hard and soft skills that occur throughout a year. And they also have focused support for political campaigns. When you think about how to take part in our programs with the Food Systems Leadership Network, the resource and network is open to all. So you should definitely just sign up to be a part of their network and their virtual community. They will have a formal ap application for their mentorship program as well as formal applications for their leadership retreats. Castanea Fellowship has a formal application for our fellowship. We will have open webinars and regional gatherings, and we will also, we also have an open process to join as a community advisor. The HEAL School of Political Leadership has a formal application for 
being a part of their fellowship, as well as membership opportunities, which I hope we can get to a little bit more during the question and answer. And you can always become a grassroots supporter of Keown. I also wanted to recap our dates. Now remember, we had sent you all the PDF, so you can refer to these. We hope you use that document to further kind of get into greater detail, detail if you need, but we did want to lay out all of the dates for you so you had a chance to see what was coming up and when. Um, as you know, the applications for the Community Food Systems Mentorship Program are coming up really quickly this December, and then the mentorship will begin in February. For the Network Leadership Retreat, that will applications open in February, and they will close in March, and it will begin in May. Castanea Fellowship, our applications are open. Um, they will be, the rounds are all listed here, and then we'll be announcing our fellows in May, as well as having a welcome webinar then. You can see the place-based learning dates. And I wanted to say that next week, we'll be able to finalize the exact dates for June and November, which we will publish on our website for you all. Um, the Hale School of Political Leadership applications open at the end of January. Really exciting. And the decisions will be confirmed in March. The first in-person session will be in May 21st to the 25th in Albuquerque. And then there will be quarterly meetings thereafter. I hope this recap was helpful to kind of help you see the, some of the connections and overlapping goals and timelines of all of our programs. And now I'm going to pass it back to Susan to kind of help us go through our questions and answers session. Sure, so we've got um, a ton of questions. Um, and let's see, I, one thing maybe, um, Navina, if you wanted to speak to the application process for, um, for HEAL, kind of what's involved in, in that process for potential um, leaders in that program. Yeah, sure. So like I mentioned, our applications will be available at the end of January. Uh, what we ask folks to uh, talk about in their application is, is who you are, why you're interested in the program, what kind of work you uh, will be doing in your community. And one of the things that we're really looking for is that, um, that you have a community of folks that you're accountable to and that you're working in in some way. We're really not thinking about this. I think Susan mentioned this before. It's not about the individual leader that's gonna be at the front of the room, but really about how we're building our collective power. Um, so one of the things we're really looking for is how you are already um, working with folks, that you have folks that um, you will continue to do that work with um, through the years ahead. And then we do ask for, um, you to submit uh, references, uh, including if you have a letter of recommendation from a HEAL member organization, that goes a long way. Um, and uh, once folks have filled out the initial application, then we do a series of um, follow-ups and assessments with folks about the skill level where folks are at. Uh, so we make sure that we design the curriculum uh, in the best way for the people who are actually part of the cohort. And again, we're, we're going through our evaluation from this year. And so things will look a little bit different next year. You know, while you're talking about it, I think there was also a question in here about um, what it means to be a member of um, Heal Food Alliance. You know, want to speak to that a little bit and maybe where people could go for more information? Yeah. Um, so folks can definitely send an email to our membership engagement and training lead, Nikki Lewis, if they're interested in finding out more about becoming a member of HEAL. Um, so N-I-K-K-I at HEALFoodAlliance.org. I can type that into the um, answers as well. Um, but what it means to become a member organization of HEAL is that, like I said, your organization is committing to um, the set of values uh, that we all stand for, the committing to upholding the platform and committing to uh, doing, doing shared work towards meeting our goals. So um, that can be involvement in our work towards building more political leadership, or it can be around um, building power in our local communities or working to expose and dismantle corporate control of our food system. And there are, there are specific campaigns and programs that we're collectively working on in each of those areas um, that we can definitely chat more about. Later. Um, sorry, there's a lot of great questions in here, so it's always tricky yeah. trying to figure out what the right flow should be. Um, but I just wanted to point out one here. Um, the let's see, 
I think it's Maya. Maya, thanks for your comment here. She says that these are all such wonderful opportunities to engage, learn, and leverage. Is there any reason that one should not apply to all three? Um, mm -hmm. Any disadvantages either way? I'd love to hear um, from you both how you'd answer that question. I think that, go, go ahead, Navina. <laughs> well, Susan, I think you can answer it too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will say, you know, the, the thing with the Food Systems Leadership Network is that it's really easy to sort of dip in and dip out, um, depending on what your, your bandwidth, um, your, your schedule, et cetera, is looking like right now. Um, whereas the other two programs are, are more kind of, you know, immersive um, commitments and, you know, for a little bit smaller of a group, like a, a real intensive group. So I think for sure, you know, having kind of food systems leadership network, anybody can join and it'd be really easy to sort of take what you want. Um, and with the other two, it's, it requires a, a more significant commitment. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I think that something that's worth folks thinking about is just what do you actually have the capacity for? Um, and mm -hmm. I think, most folks are are working pretty high intensity jobs already if you're if you're in a position that you're looking for this further further leadership so ensuring that whatever you apply for is something that you actually can commit to um we don't want to give a spot to somebody who's not actually going to be able to fulfill on all of the uh program requirements so that's something to think about and then i think really thinking about what you what you're most interested in um and where where right now in your trajectory um, you need to be building your skills and to think about which which one or combination of them might be the right fit for you. Farsana, anything you want to add to that? Well, that was perfect. This is why I enjoy working with the both of you. I think we covered that. <laughs> um, so there's this whole slew of questions around Castanea. I started um, to up. <laughs> So um, one question here is about the role of the nonprofit partner um, mm -hmm. from Devra. And she's asking, um, are they asking, are they expected to um, pledge any funds towards this programming? Mm -hmm. um, are they expected to pledge any funds? Can, can you read that part of the question again for the fiscal yeah, sponsorship? The, okay. the, yeah, the, I think it's probably around the fiscal sponsorship, yeah. um, okay. but the role of the nonprofit partner. Got it. So before I get to that, let me just see if I can share a little bit more about what I've been picking up from the questions and answer them collectively. And then I am actually going to hand it over to our, our colleagues at Windward Fund who can share a little bit more about the fiscal sponsorship requirement. So first, let me say when we talk about um, the experience that's required and we set a minimum of five, someone asked, is it five to 10 or is it like 20? Honestly, we're looking for a range. So we want engaged leaders and we want this to be an intergenerational cohort. So if you've been doing this work for 20 years or 30 years, you're welcome to apply. If you've been doing this work for five, 15, seven, you're welcome to apply. And someone had asked a question about what does food systems work look like? You know, we realize that food systems work is pretty big. There was a chef who asked, would they be considered as doing food systems work? My answer is yes. If you are doing anything with regards to growing food, helping get food to people, thinking about the policies and systems, farming, also thinking about food waste, it all connects social justice, racial justice, economic justice. So if you identify as your work being part of the food system work, then we want you to apply. The other thing that I've been hearing is like, are there, do we cover travel costs for these trips? And the answer is yes. We will be covering travel costs in addition to providing a grant stipend. The other piece, I think Can I, can I jump in right there for Zana? Because I saw a couple questions for Sopal about travel costs too. Um, and we, we do provide scholarships for folks who need them. Um, we cover, cover all room and board um, and the cost of trainers and things like that for everyone. We don't provide a stipend, but if, you're, if you and your organization need us to cover your travel costs, we will do that to the extent that we're able. Mm -hmm. I'll add the same for our leadership retreats. Um, we can provide scholarships for travel to and from the retreat. Um, and once um, participants are there, all their costs are covered. Um, and similarly with um, some of our other you know, gatherings and such, we can provide scholarships for attendance. Mm -hmm. Great. And then I know you had asked about the fiscal sponsorship, Susan. Jennifer, I wanted to invite you to sort of join the call and share from your perspective what's important for folks to know about the fiscal sponsorship requirement for this fellowship. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Farzana, and thank you for everybody for joining us today as well. My name is Jennifer Lambert with the Windward Fund. So we prefer, we support the Castaneda Fellowship um, actually as their fiscal sponsor for the project. So um, I have lots of insights into uh, what it would require on the fiscal sponsor side. Um, so really just wanted to start off with the fact that um, you know, in, in giving this grant to an individual, it's actually heavily regulated by the IRS. So what we're doing um, and what is the model, the fiscal sponsor model that we're employing is that we're just asking a C3 organization that has status with the IRS. Um, so that was an answer to actually one of the questions about an organization that um, somebody worked with. If you have an organization, we're just looking for C3 status with the IRS. So that'd be determined with the IRS determination letter is something we'd be looking for. Um, as a qualifying organization. And then what we're looking uh, for the organization to do is just really be a steward of the funds. So um, they're just making, that organization's just making sure that um, they are receiving the funds from us and then they're administering them. So making sure that they're being used for the charitable purpose that they were designated for. Um, so within that, um, if you have any further more specific questions, I really wanted to keep it pretty general on that part. They're just going to be receiving the funds, being stewards of the funds, um, to direct any very, very specific questions to Farzana, um, and she can connect you further with me. Her contact information is on the slide as well on the screen. Um, but I understand it could be a little bit confusing, um, the fiscal sponsorship setup, so I do really encourage you to ask further questions via email. And I just want to add two quick things. A fiscal sponsor doesn't mean that they will have to add money. If there's no financial requirement required from an organization. I think your framing around the stewardship was really important. They will just be the stewards for your grant award. And then the other thing is you don't have to have all of these details figured out in the application process. You just check a box to make sure you're in the process of working with somebody. The more you advance through this process of applying for Castanea, the more information that you'll be gathering and that will be gathering. So just wanted to also mention that. And if I can, just quickly answer one question. For this first application piece, I saw a couple of questions around what is um, required for examples of work. And really, that's just open to you. And actually, Navina really kind of helped. She's part of our um, outreach committee is that that can be something that is non-written. That's an article that you've written. It can be a picture of something that's really important to you. It can be a video. So that's really open. There's no specific requirements. We want you to be able to feel free to share with us something besides a written word um, or an article that's been that you already have with us. So I'll stop and I hope that answered most of those questions. Thank you, Susan and Jennifer. I, I wanted to answer one question that's in there, Susan, not to make it all be on you to, to figure out what questions we answer. Um, so, so one of the questions that's in here is about whether undocumented folks are eligible for all of these programs, and um, maybe we can each answer this for um, for for SOPL, which somebody asked, it stands for School of Political Leadership. Um, it there's there's no citizenship requirement. Um, we. Uh, we just, in terms of figuring out travel, would want to make sure that we um, take care of our people. We, on this, in this year, we did go to the border, and so we just want to make sure that folks are safe. And that's the two Likewise, with Systems Leadership Network, we don't have any restrictions. Um, come one, come all. Um, I saw a couple of questions in here about sort of, um, you know, what's available for folks that are maybe um, starting out in their careers in food systems leadership or in, in food systems and community-based food systems development. Um, and, you know, recognizing that um, maybe some of the programs are, or you're, if, you know, especially with Castanea, if you're further along um, in your career, a little bit more of established leader, um, where can folks that are starting out get um, some resources and information? And, you know, I would recommend that the, the Food Systems Leadership Network is probably a good place for you, um, both in terms of the, you know, the webinar offerings that really give you a taste of the kind of work that's out there. Um, the nonprofit boot camp e-learning series is a great way to get some of the fundamentals and sort of nuts and bolts of nonprofit management and leadership. Um, and we have a, a really significant webinar archive and tools and resources archive, um, both within the Food Systems Leadership Network and the Wallace Center's website. Um, 
NGFN.org, the National Good Food Network. Um, so please, you know, if anybody that's interested in learning more about that, please reach out directly to me. I'd be happy to, to connect you in. Um, the mentorship program can also be a really effective way of kind of figuring out what your direction is and, um, you know, where might you be able to apply your um, individual unique skills and passion um, into this work. So um, I'd encourage you to, you know, look at that program as an opportunity too, because there's no requirements in terms of um, how many years you've been involved. We've had folks that are very established in their careers that are participating in the mentorship program and folks that are getting, um, just getting started in the last year or two. Um, so that's another great opportunity. And same, similarly with our leadership retreats, um, we, we really try to put together cohorts that represent um, this maximum diversity in terms of perspective, lived experience, um, and age, honestly, because, you know, a lot of younger leaders are bringing, you know, just some fierce new ways of, of seeing and being in the world that, you know, some of us that are, have been in the work for a longer time, like, need and want to hear from. And so it just makes it an even more dynamic experience when we've got folks that are maybe even brand new to the work because they're seeing it in fresh eyes. So please don't be discouraged. Um, from from applying for our leadership retreats if your if your leadership journey is just getting started and for for Sopal too while we do want to see that you are clearly committed to your community and the work um, there's no age or number of years of experience requirement for it we, in this year um, our youngest participant was 18 years old um, and we went up to maybe it was 19 when we started um, and we went up to folks in their in their mid 40s this year and we're open to to any age if you have that kind of commitment and in our case um we're also very interested in folks who may be newer to food systems work but have been doing racial and social justice organizing in their own communities and want to figure out how to bring um, food and farm work more into that There's a couple of interesting um, questions in here about um, cooperatives and asking if a group, a member of a group working towards a cooperative be eligible um, for participation. I think this might be towards Castanea. Um, and, you know, kind of clarifying whether this fellowship will have an element of developing structures outside of nonprofits such as cooperatives. Um, so I think, Farsana, that's directed towards you. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> My quick answer to that would be yes and yes. Um, you should definitely feel like you can apply if you're part of a cooperative or working to form one. And when we talked about our place-based visits, for example, when we go to the South, I'm really interested in showcasing some of the amazing cooperative work that's been going out there for generations and decades. So, yes and yes. Um, sorry, there's like a lot of questions in here. This is um, it's an interesting <laughs> challenge. So, <laughs> and I, we should also just share that we'll do our best to answer these questions and whatever we don't get to now, we'll make sure to follow up in some forum by email. Um, this is a great list of questions. Thank you, everyone. And the presentation um, will be available after, too. Hey, Navina, do you want to speak to um, what communities will be the focus of attention for Sopal in 2019? Yeah, so we'll, um, we're really going to shape it based on where folks are coming from um, and where, where the interest is and where we can build power together. So I don't have definitive areas that we'll be focusing on yet, um, but we'll have a stronger sense of that by the time applications go out. Mm -hmm. um, Farsana, there's a question here from Melanie, um, and this might be um, relevant for others here too, who are working on projects internationally and are um, tuning in today. Is, this, is the Castaneda Fellowship open to folks that are doing their work abroad? You know, that's a really good question. So I think her question was, we have a 501c3 as a partner, and they reside in the US, but their project work is based out of the US, and if they're eligible to apply. Um, I think 
yes, you'd be eligible to apply, but I'd want to know the strong connection towards the U.S. food systems in that international work. So there would have to be a clear connection there um, to ensure that we're kind of sticking to, or it's hard to sort of figure out our tent, and international work is so important, but we are trying to kind of, in our first year, um, make sure we have a good group that is working on things in the United States and you're welcome to apply as well. And I think as long as you can make the strong connection of your international work towards the work that you're doing in the States, then it should work. I see that there are a couple of questions about um, applications for our um, food systems leadership retreats and specifically the, the network leadership retreat that we'll be doing in May in partnership with Food Solutions New England. Um, so anyone who is associated with a 501c3 kind of similarly to um, how Jen was speaking about the Windward Fund is eligible to apply um, to participate in the retreat. Um, and it's, it is open to anyone, but we do have an application process so that we can make sure that we're putting together a cohort that is um, representative of the diversity of, of people and places that are a part of this, um, of this movement. And so we do have a formal application process um, to you know, really kind of help curate a very dynamic group to participate and make sure also that there's kind of a shared practice in terms of folks that are, um, are leading and weaving food systems networks, whether that be um, at the very local level or at the national level. Um, and kind of the focus for that retreat is recognizing that there's like a real specific set of skills that goes in hand with lead a network um, and trying to connect people and places together um, and so you know that's what we'll be looking for as folks that are engaged in, in network building um, for that retreat so anybody who has any specific questions about that can reach out to me directly um, Navina and Farsana do y'all have any other um, bits of information that you want to make sure and, and catch on I mean there's a lot of like really detailed questions that may be better to follow up with an FAQ um, was there anything else that y'all want to make sure and address before we um, sign off? We can maybe give sign I'm off a couple of minutes early. <laughs> take a minute. To, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe I'll just hear for Sana, uh, uh, Sorry about a by the stipend amount. I don't know if you want to talk at all about that amount or what is if there's any expectations around that. Sure. Um, so I saw a couple of that. First, the reason that we have a stipend is during our design phase, we learned that it's really important, especially if we want to support leaders who are underrepresented, to honor the time away from work, to be able to offer them some sort of remuneration for their time towards what it'll take to be involved in this. So um, we that number was sort of something that we were able to do that felt right, that was meaningful for us, and that's how we came up with it. And with regards to how it's used, it really depends on your fiscal sponsorship and the stewardship with which the agreement you make. Um, we are not going to tell you, you know, you can use it for your work or you can figure out with your um, partner organization how that might be applying just to your own professional development. So I hope that answers the question. And if there's further questions, please feel free to email me and I'll loop in Jennifer who can give you even further details around that. For Sana, there's a great question here from Susanna who is asking um, how you see the Castanea Fellowship growing in the coming years. Um, is there dedicated funding beyond this inaugural cohort? And are there intentions around keeping the first, first cohort, connect, co the cohort connected to the program as it grows? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and it's also, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things is we are also connected to the alumni of the Kellogg Food and Community Fellows as well as their food policy and another P <laughs> fellowship, forgive me. Um, so you're already coming in with a group of alumni who are pretty active and we do plan to kind of work. And I'd love to like, you know, as we are all talking here in this call, I think there's a lot of room to figure out how we continue to grow that. Um, and then that question was also about, yeah, for our funding, yes, we are secured with regards to starting our second cohort. We'd be recruiting for our second cohort um, so that we would start simultaneously. So we hope to have 
this year it'll be one cohort and next year we'll have year one of the first cohort. Sorry, we'll have two simultaneous that year. <laughs> so um, we're looking forward to um, learning as we go. As Susan said in the beginning, we'll be learning and growing, but also want to be really clear with what we're offering this first cohort. And I see a couple of questions in here about working in rural communities. And I think just to reiterate for all of us, we're really focused on building bridges between urban and rural communities and definitely um, are seeking and want the perspectives of folks who come from all different kinds of communities and, and um, ground our work in the importance of that. So I think mm -hmm. folks are considering applying to any of these, but that's, that's a piece that we all are really attentive to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe there's a couple of questions um, about eligibility for the different programs of the Food Systems Leadership Network. There's no limitations. So if you have, you know, ex receive, if you, for example, if you've participated in mentorship and you want to attend a leadership retreat, um, you know, apply. There's no limitations. It's not like you can only do one thing and not others. Um, so, you know, and, and, and actually, I mean, what we're looking to do is to continue to build connectivity um, with the folks that participate. Um, and so just being able to, you know, have more points of contact with you is a great thing. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, if something interests you, go ahead and apply. Don't, don't be discouraged if you've already participated in something. Um, great. Well, I think we've answered a whole lot of um, fantastic questions. I appreciate um, everyone's participation and um, want to commit to filling out a FAQ with answers to all the remaining questions and send that out to um, all the registrants so we can follow up with more information. Um, and maybe if we just want to have a couple of kind of closing salutations and appreciations. Um, I just want to thank Farsana and Navina for being collaborative and pulling together um, this webinar today. I'm really looking forward to continuing to work um, as allies and accomplices with you and also in kind of envisioning how we can um, weave opportunities between our different programs um, and recognizing that, you know, y'all have um, some amazing people involved in your work and similarly in overlaps in our network. So I'm just looking forward to that opportunity um, continue to evolve in the years to come and just want to thank everybody out there who's listening um, and for, you know, leaning into this opportunity and seeking out continued opportunities for growth um, and development and for the work that you're doing in community. Thank you. Um, it's going to take all of us. So um, really appreciate your time and commitment um, to this work and to, um, to your communities. Um, Farsan and Avina, you guys want to make some closing remarks? Sure. I want to also just thank you, Susan and Navina, and also Jeff, who's in the background with all of our tech um, and helping us along, and everyone who's on this call. Just really appreciate you making the time. And I'm excited for how we are sort of joining and having conversations about what our work can look like and how we can come together and support our various work as part of this larger goal for like movement building and strengthening our power and our leaders. And just really appreciate all of you on the line today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for um, for being a part of this conversation. As someone who is involved in two of the initiatives that are that are here, it's been pretty amazing to see the amount of uh, support for these kind of leadership opportunities and the overwhelming interest in these kind of leadership opportunities. It gives me a lot of hope for what's possible um, for our movement and our collective future um, through this kind of work. So thank you all. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. Um, onward forward. Ciao. Thanks.